Welcome back. In today's video, Internet Computer is now accelerating their DeFi ecosystem as we're entering the bull market of 2024 and 2025. And we're going to be discussing a lot of DeFi ecosystems out here and why Internet Computer needs to continue this path so that they can become a top 10 cryptocurrency. And we're also going to be talking about Solana, Ethereum ETF approval. Uh, I'm buying Ethereum and uh, much, much more. We're going to talk about a lot of the ecosystems, real world assets, but we're going to be starting right here with some Ripple and Tether drama. But before we go there, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. We upload every single day of the year to bring you the latest happening in the financial world. Hopefully you guys enjoy these type of videos. And if you do, give the video a free thumbs up and let me know down below what other kind of content you want to see right here on the channel. You can also follow me on x.com slash the Cryptovisor. So there's a lot of drama with Ripple and Tether right now. Ripple's CEO, Brad Garlinghouse, says it's clear that the US government is going after stablecoin issuer Tether, which could have an unpredictable impact on the crypto markets. He went on a podcast where he said there would be 100% be another crypto-related black swan event like the collapse of FTX. He said the US government is going after Tether. That is clear to him. He said... Um, without elaborating and stopping short of suggesting any possible U.S. action against Tether, that this could be the black swan. He said, I view Tether as a very important part of the ecosystem. But he added he doesn't know how to predict what impact the U.S. regulatory action against Tether would have on the crypto ecosystem. Now, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of background, Tether has been, um, Tether has been kind of under scrutiny for years in the US, right? I mean, New York sued Tether and said that they weren't actually backed one-to-one. -one. Uh, New York went through with this lawsuit for a few years and they dropped the suit and settled for some kind of monetary uh, penalty. But we've heard this over and over and over about Tether, that they're gonna be shut down, that they're not really backed or anything like that. Personally, I think it's all just FUD, right? Maybe it's not, I don't know. Uh, but bottom line is Tether, is pretty big outside the US as well. And so I feel like if the US wanted to shut down Tether, they probably already would have tried it, right? Maybe, maybe not. But either way, Paolo Adorno, who is the chief executive at Tether and chief technology officer at Bifinex, it's basically like almost the same company, he wrote on X in response. He said, an uninformed CEO leading a company being investigated by the SEC and also launching a competitive stable coin is being reported spreading FUD about Tether. Now, by the way, um, I think I have the article here. Yeah, Ripple said that they want to launch a US dollar stable coin taking on the $150 billion market dominated by Tether and Circle. Uh, they announced this in April. They said that they were going to create their own stable coin, which is, again, so now you have a competitor. And in, in, listen, by the way, Ripple, they, they, I don't th even think the, the lawsuit with the SEC is up, right? They have all of this pushing against them and they're, they're going to create their own stable coin. So now if they do create another stable coin, Tether is obviously a competitor, right? You don't hear Circle talking about Tether in this kind of way. So Paulo Adorno said, let me give you an update on Tether's ecosystem safety. Tether is the most used stablecoin in the world with hundreds of millions of users across primarily emerging markets and developing countries. Entire communities across these regions are unbanked, left behind by traditional banking systems because they're too poor to be of interest and are using Tether daily as their checking and savings account. He said at Tether, we believe that our main mission is to ensure that the entire community can benefit from a safe global financial ecosystem. There are, in fact, different crucial requirements that stablecoins need to fulfill in order to become widely adopted. Tether proved over time to have strong price stability, highly liquid reserves, top tier custodians, and profound compliance. And listen, guys, I agree. I agree, right? I don't personally don't use Tether, but there are a lot of people around the world that do. A lot of companies that do. And everybody has said for years, Tether is, is not really um, back. They have no reserves. It's a Ponzi. The same way that they've said this about Binance. But these two, Binance and Tether, they have done more to protect their customers than many of the other cryptos in general. 
And so, I mean, personally, I have more of a issue with Ripple continuing to sell XRP to this on the retail market to you versus what Tether's doing. So I, 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 I don't necessarily agree with what Ripple CEO is saying. And by the way, we have another response from him on this whole post. But Tether's CEO says, while all the above topics have been heavily discussed in the past, today I want to share updated statistics and key points regarding the ecosystem. He said, while I revealed in many interviews the following information, most mainstream media newspapers evidently refuse to report such data. Unfortunately, the narrative that they're the most interested in spreading is sensational against the usage of stablecoins and cryptos around the world, likely to protect the old financial system. They say Tether stablecoins respect OFAC and SDN lists. Tether has highly trained internal investigation teams that rely on a wide variety of tools to monitor primary and secondary markets. He says Tether's collaboration with Chainalysis helps our teams to have the best in class software and training for proactive monitoring activity. Tether collaborated since inception with 124 law enforcement agencies across 40 different countries. Tether blocked more than $1.3 billion since inception, mostly related to scams, hacks, and ML. I don't know what that is. Approximately $1.6 million is related to terrorist finance. Tether collaborated on a voluntary basis with all of these law enforcement requests. Tether blocked more than $639 million by working with U.S. law enforcement. Tether onboarded FBI and U.S. Secret Service for reissuances. Tether collaborates with Israel's, I don't know what that is, and Ukraine law enforcement. Tether cooperates directly with law enforcement agencies while other stable coins, although they claim to be more compliant, they require a judge's order allowing hackers, scammers, and criminals to a long time to move funds around. So that's what the CEO of Tether said. Now, Brad Garlinghouse responded to that and said, I wasn't attacking Tether. The next words out of my mouth during that podcast were that I view Tether as a hugely important part of the ecosystem. He said, my point was that the U.S. government has clearly indicated they want more control over USD-backed stablecoin issuers, and thus, Tether, as the largest player, is in their line of sight. <sighs> more drama. And we are now in election year, guys. What the, what the one side is going to do versus what the other side is going to do we already see very clear the current administration is anti-crypto, right? Anti-crypto army. The SEC is going after every cryptocurrency company like Coinbase and Ripple and all of these, right? And the other side is saying the hostility needs to end. And if you like crypto, you need to vote for that side. Listen, is either side going to make crypto, you know, the greatest and the best in the world? I don't know. What I do know is a lot of this is just noise, guys. As an investor, it shouldn't matter, right? You invest where the markets move. And if the markets are moving away from crypto, which eventually they will, right? There's going to be a new thing. Maybe it's going to be AI. Maybe it's going to be uh, robotics in your homes, right? That, those, those are going to have great opportunity to make huge sums of money uh, by investing in companies that are building those kind of products and uh, technology. So as I've explained, Wall Street is in control right now, right? They control the markets. They have the money, right? What me and you buying a little bit of Bitcoin is not going to change the trajectory of where this is going. Now, if Wall Street starts buying more, clearly the market's going higher. If they keep creating more uh, products for ETFs in these other ecosystems, clearly crypto is going to go higher. So a lot of this is just noise, guys. A lot of it is noise. And we have to focus on our investment strategy and thesis, and that's it. Talking about our investment strategy and thesis, Franklin Templeton, which recently um, was shilling Solana, now they're talking about base, saying it's base season. They posted this in May and said one of the most adopted layer twos on Ethereum is base, which is Coinbase's blockchain, launched in February of 2023 by Coinbase. Base is built... Uh, as a layer two using the optimism stack and secured by Ethereum. The OP stack is a collective of software protocols that powers the optimism network and provides the building blocks to construct layer two blockchain solutions on top of Ethereum. In recent months, they say base has seen significant rise in activity, primarily driven by base meme coin trading activity and social finance applications such as friend tech. 
over this time frame base has also seen a large increase in the supply of USDC on the network, currently reaching two and a half billion dollars. In December of last year, Coinbase announced free transfers of USDC on base using the Coinbase wallet. Base also hit momentum in the world of social finance with several of the top crypto based social applications built on base. Currently base has 46% of all transactions related to social finance. This category is key vertical to watch for base adoption and growth. One application is Friendtech, a mobile only application to find uh, financializes the social worth of users on the network. Users can buy the keys or shares of influencers to gain access to the influencers chat room. On May 3rd, Friendtech launched version 2 of the platform as well as an airdrop of their token called Friend. The token is currently trading at a market cap of $200 million and is 100% fully owned by the users of Friendtech. And so again, the winners are emerging. Some of these, there's no coin. Base has no coin. And they said they're never going to have a coin. But you know what the coin is for base? Coinbase stock, right? That's the bottom line. Coinbase stock is what I think uh, going to be a derivative of this blockchain. So yeah, blockchain is already in the stock market besides just the Bitcoin ETFs. But there's a lot of other things going on talking about Coinbase. Goldfinch, which is backed by some of the developers who used to work at Coinbase, they wrote this, great to see the latest report from Grayscale on blockchains and the tokenization revolution. It covers tokenization present and future and includes notable launches such as Goldfinch, which is used for credit and other members of the Token Asset Coalition. So obviously we know about Grayscale. They posted this in April and it's called Block Public Blockchains and the Tokenization, tokenization Revolution. Uh, basically, it says tokenization refers to the registration of asset ownership on blockchain infrastructure. In tokenized form, assets can potentially benefit from a blockchain functionality, including more efficient settlement and the ability to interact with smart contracts. For the most part, the modern financial system is already fairly efficient and tokenization itself may not lead to immediate efficiency gains. Rather, the main benefits we could, we believe could come from bringing together users, assets, and applications onto a common global platform. And so uh, they talk a little bit about system efficiency, programmability, accessibility, lowering costs, tokenizing the world, right? We've been talking about this for years. Coinbase is already custodying coins that are tokenized versions of ownership in, uh, of condos around the, the country. If you go to Coinbase custody and you look at the assets that they actually custody on their platform, several of these, around maybe 10 to 20, are tokens that are actually real world assets, condos. So they're already tokenizing condo ownership. So if you own, well, Coinbase custodies the coin that says that you own that condo. And then when you sell the condo, the, the coin gets transferred to a new person, right? So this is on a public ledger versus, I mean, some places it's still on paper. Right, and you have to have a paper title or paper paper deed to a home, and so Goldfinch is definitely one of these assets that I am extremely excited about. Uh, in February of 2021, the, this project launched Goldfinch Finance launch, and you know since then they have currently 70 almost 74 million dollars in loans, a small loss rate, but they do have a loss rate, and you can participate on both ends, right, the borrowing and the lending end, and. You know, they offer 8.51% currently for uh, Goldfinch senior pools of USDC. So you can um, like loan your USDC for 8.51%. They loan it out to these companies or projects that need it. Now, recently, there hasn't been any new projects that have been using this, uh, this ecosystem. But a lot of this, I think, is just because the whole credit market, generally speaking, is not doing well because the Federal Reserve has been raising rates and credit has been tightened over the last few years. And it's not all bull market. Now kind of we're in the post having era of 2024. And I think the, the, we're in the bull market, right? It may not necessarily feel it right now, but we are in the bull market. And the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates soon. When that means, I don't know. And I don't think it really matters, right? They're, they're already easing in certain aspects of the financial ecosystem. So when this starts to happen, credit is going to start to flow. People are going to start building their businesses out, buying homes, uh, taking loans to grow, you know, other investments or whatever. 
And this is a big potential for Goldfinch. Now, from a like an investability perspective, if you look at GFI, it has done basically a 10x from the lows that we saw last year in 2020. Uh, 2023. You can see that basically in September of 2023, we're about three thirty-seven cents. And now we're at $3.70, right? At the high, it was $6. So it basically did a 20X over the course of six, seven months. Now we've come down a little bit and we're still kind of in the $3.70, $3.80 range, which is still a 10X from where we were. So a lot of people are still bullish on it and getting bullish on it. Now, personally, I've taken, taken profits out of the market. A lot of people don't really understand. We're gonna be talking about internet computer in a minute. On a recent internet computer video, I said, you know, I didn't own any ICP and people are like, Cryptovice, what do you mean you don't own ICP? It's like, guys, if, a, if an asset goes up five or 10 X, that, that in my view, that's a profit taking opportunity, right? Um, because the market's correct, markets drop. And that's just kind of how the cycles flow. And we did, we went from $6 down to $3, it's a 50% drop. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily right for your investment thesis or strategy, but keep in mind, the market cap right now is $286 million. When we started investing on this channel, it was 10 times lower than that. So $20, $30 million market cap. That, that was a micro, micro, micro cap crypto. And now it's getting into the mega leagues, right? And so in my view, we still have a little bit of a way to come down or correct. Maybe not, but it doesn't really matter. Because at the end of the day, even if you think it's going to $2 billion and we start to see the, the trend moving back higher, then I buy, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, $286 million and they only have loaned out $74 million. It seems a little bit frothy at this point, unless there's other loans that we just don't know about that are currently being discussed. The more loans they have on the platform, this is what's gonna drive the, the value up. But if you look at other like uh, like financial cryptos, I, I, I look at Maple Finance as a perfect example. These still have not pumped, right? I mean, they pumped, but not, not pumped, pumped, right? It's still under $100 million. And so I, uh, I would also look at Aave. Ave is another one, right? We've seen huge growth in Ave, but recently we've seen a nice big dip in correction. And so when these are, and this is a mega crypto, right? Over a billion dollar market cap. So if I look at the year to date here, you can see we, let's just pull up the year. Let's pull up the same time frame. September, it was $55 and it went all the way up to $150 approximately. So that's about a three X. And now we're back down to $80. So very close to those lows. So when I see this happen, when I saw Maple doing the same thing, I think Goldfinch is going to follow these kind of financial cryptos. So if one is staying elevated while the others are correcting, there's probably a correction coming. If one is staying low or correcting while the others are pumping, there's probably a pump coming. That's the way that I kind of view it, generally speaking. It's not an exact science, but we know a lot of the ecosystems kind of move along with what else is going on. The AI cryptos move together. The Bitcoin related proof of work cryptos move together. You guys kind of get it. Anyway, uh, we also have the Bitcoin ETF tracker, which is interesting to keep in mind because as I've explained previously on this videos is that Wall Street is in control. They are in control. We have seen over the last month from April into May, massive sell-offs in the Bitcoin ETFs. This is after months, four or five months of massive inflows. So we saw the inflows and the price of Bitcoin and cryptos went higher. Now we're seeing outflows. Why are we seeing outflows? Well, if you had GBTC in January, it was like $25. So it's more than doubled in price. People are taking profits. iBit, it went from, I think, $20 to $36. At Bitcoin, same kind of thing. It, most of these have doubled since the, their launches. So people are taking profits off the table. But it's also, in my view, the outflows that we're seeing, while they're not that significant, right, a few hundred million dollars here and there of outflows, they're testing the market. Very similar to the way that Elon Musk a few years ago sold some of the Bitcoin at SpaceX just to make sure the market was, uh, what he said, 
he was testing the liquidity in the market to see if he could sell billions of dollars in Bitcoin, and he did. And so this is Wall Street, in my view, testing how they can control the markets. They buy some, the market goes higher, and everybody's all excited. They sell some, everybody goes into bear mode, and everything's coming down, and the world's ending. They're going to control the entire market. That's why they're in Bitcoin, because Bitcoin dictates the rest of the cryptos where they go. So I, I watch the Bitcoin ETFs very closely, day after day, to see what they're doing. One day is not a trend. But if you see week after week after week selling, expect the market to drop. That's kind of a general <laughs> understanding of it. And if we look at the GBTC ETF, and you scroll down and look at how much Bitcoin they actually own, significant reduction. In the peak of the bull market, they had about 650,000 Bitcoin in their fund. Now they have 291,000 Bitcoin in the fund, which means that they've reduced the fund by more than half. Think about that. GBTC has sold over 359,000 Bitcoin since their peak. That's a lot. I think a lot of this has to do with diversification, with risk management. And I would, I would also go to say that there's probably part of the regulators' um, agreements with Grayscale and Digital Currency Group was that they had to sell some, right? Because we know Digital Currency Group owned a lot of these uh, GBTC shares, meaning the Bitcoin underlying as well. I believe after FTX, and the reason that we're seeing so many Bitcoin ETFs get approved all at the same time is because they need the diversification. They don't want a single issuer having 650,000 Bitcoin, right? They just don't want it. That's a huge existential risk if the US government or these other large investors and hedge funds are gonna be putting money in. That's what I think, because there's no other indication of why. Like, why would Grayscale still have a 2% fee when every other Bitcoin ETF is less than half a percent fee at this point? They want people to sell out of Grayscale because they know the regulators don't want them to hold this much. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see a much more um, distributed spread where most of these major Bitcoin ETF issuers will have around the same amount of Bitcoin in the fund. That's what I think. And they're gonna use the fees to help navigate that. So if one ETF issuer, like let's say BlackRock just starts getting, you know, they have double what every other ETF issuer has, maybe BlackRock will increase their fee to drive some people to sell out of BlackRock and buy some of the others to keep it diversified. Or they could just do that to drop the market, right? So we have to keep an eye on that. Um, but we're now also seeing ARC invest in 21 shares, drop staking plans from their Ethereum ETF proposals. I believe that we are going to see an ETF for Ethereum sooner than we won't. The week that I'm recording this video, we're getting the inflation numbers. We are going to see uh, Gary Gensler is supposed to be uh, getting questioned in Congress. We're also seeing this back and forth between the presidential candidates or presidential campaigns about who approves crypto and who doesn't. If they continue to push back on crypto and deny these ETFs, they're going to be approved eventually. Whether it's under this administration, another administration, Gary Gensler, another person, it's gonna be approved. It's just a matter of when. Personally, I started buying Ethereum because I think the likelihood that we're gonna see Ethereum get ETF get approved in 2024, chances are growing by the day. Things like this, where they're adjusting their, their ETF proposals weeks before they're supposed to get a decision, plus with all of the political back and forth that's going on, I think the likelihood that we're gonna see an approval is growing by the day. Because it's not like just a random person wants a Bitcoin or an Ethereum ETF. These are large issuers, BlackRock, ARK, 21 shares, Fidelity, they all want an Ethereum ETF. And so if they're all pushing for one and you have one agency saying, well, you know, it's, it's not that great. We, we're not so sure they're, you know, these are scams and pawn. This is not going to bode well 
from a political standpoint in an election year. So that's why I think it's actually going to get approved. So yeah, I own Ethereum for the first time in many years. Moving right along to internet computer, one of my favorite topics in crypto. Don't forget to give this video a free thumbs up and also hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss a new video. Nothing I say is financial advice. Make sure you guys do your own research. You could be wrong about anything and everything that I say. Now, internet computer is in kind of an interesting position, right? A lot of technology, a lot of growth, a lot of excitement, a lot of, you know, current technology that is live on the chain like AI, right? We just heard from Dominic recently about the AI capabilities of the internet computer. Let's, let's watch what he says here. Deterministic time slicing is a huge achievement. So the internet computer actually can run comput smart contract computations that span multiple blocks. And essentially what it does is it has like four logical uh, processes, which, which are actually real processes on these node machines. And, you know, it puts a smart contract onto the processor, lets it consume a certain number of cycles, internet computer equivalent of gas, and then yeah. takes it off the processor and puts another um, smart contract on. And uh, these, the computations, you know, these smart contract functions that are being evoked, which transactions essentially, can be executed over multiple blocks. And so you can actually do a huge amount of computation in a single smart contract transaction. And this is a huge advance because it essentially m means that the internet computer is a genuine decentralized operating system. Which is effectively a true internet computer, right? It is an internet computer. And so ICP is well positioned in this cycle, in my view, right? They have the ability to, like they already have AI compute on the blockchain. We've already seen this. They're already growing it. They're, they're advancing the technology. They're currently developing it. They're looking to change and lower the inflation through neuron dissolve delay decreases uh, in terms of how long you're staking your coins in the ecosystem for. This will also reduce the inflation and help the tokenomics of the overall uh, ecosystem. They're looking into you know, some type of liquid staking or liquid neuron dissolve delay or swapping, basically it's liquid staking. It's just creating another <laughs> version of liquid staking. And why is internet computer doing this? Well, in my view, it's because Dfinity, Dominic, and the developers of ICP understand that internet computer needs to advance in the DeFi space. Because if we look at the current DeFi ecosystem, there's $90 billion locked in DeFi across all the different chains. But if we look at internet computer, internet computer is, I mean, it, it's just not even close, right? $90 billion, ICP has less than 100 million locked in total value. Now, some of this does have to do with how this system operates and the fact that internet computer is not really a DeFi uh, ecosystem, right? It's the internet computer. It's really for compute data, the ability for AI to run on the blockchain, uh, you to run smart contracts, uh, very large smart contracts, and a lot of, um, a lot of high bandwidth compute. Th this is very different than what we see in other ecosystems where they're just financial processors, right? They just transfer value back and forth from one wallet to another. Their smart contracts execute financial contracts from one wallet to another, and there's really nothing else built on it. This is why you have layer twos, layer threes, layer fours building on top of Ethereum, because the base layer of Ethereum, it, it, even if you wanted to, you couldn't run AI on it. You need other layers to do that. Same thing with Solana, same thing with um, Polygon, same thing with Polkadot. I mean, Cardano, <laughs> we're not even gonna talk about Cardano, but internet computers, DeFi is not where it needs to be. But this is a huge superpower in my view. Why? Because internet computer has the ability to grow. And we're not just seeing the ability to grow, but we're seeing internet computer actually growing, okay? So uh, I saw this tweet from Dfinity that says, introducing ICPX, which is a DEX on internet computer that is pushing the boundaries of DeFi and tra trading in Web3. The PMM and smart contract or smart routing algorithms, it optimizes capital use and price discovery. And so learning a little bit more, this is what ICPX says. ICPX is a decentralized finance hub for Web3. It's pioneering decentralized exchange built on the internet computer protocol, pushing the boundaries of DeFi and trading. 
They're employing the PMM algorithm as well as the proprietary smart routing algorithm, allowing for more efficient capital utilization and better price discovery. Additionally, the exchange supports effortless token creation with options like upgraded ICRC 2 plus protocol, which users can customize for their projects without any coding experience. ICPX's diverse liquidity options include public, private, and anchored pools, each managed within secure internet computer canisters. The platform is designed to be user-centric, offering integrated wallets, detailed analytics dashboards, and advanced trading features to enhance the trading experience and support community-led DeFi projects. This is big because if we take this, combine it with what we are hearing about internet computer changing the way that their staking ecosystem operates through some proposals that they're putting up for votes, it tells me that Dfinity, the developers, internet computer is multifaceted and attacking where crypto and blockchain are going not just in one avenue, right? A lot of ecosystems, last cycle to this cycle, they've just been focused on NFTs, right? I mean, they're, they're, the only thing processing on their blockchain is NFTs, right? Nothing else. Some, like Ethereum, these are sm uh, financial smart contracts, right? The, the, the financial operating system for the world, effectively. Bitcoin, granted, there's some things that are being built on top of Bitcoin, but the base layer doesn't really have the capabilities to, to scale and grow or increase the speed of transaction processing. And so when they are looking to adjust or increase the, technolo the technology on the, on the blockchains, they have to do it piece by piece by piece. And what internet computer is doing is they're looking at AI, they're looking at staking, they're looking at inflation. Now they're also looking at DeFi because the DeFi ecosystem for ICP is big because not only can I, it, it, I mean, this is really, more walled and siloed for ICP, right, through an ICP DEX. But remember, Internet Computer has chain key or chain fusion technology, which allows it to read and write on other blockchains or interoperate or cross-chain communicate or be a multi-omni-chain blockchain, right? So when I'm looking at all of the major cryptos in the top 50 with potential, there's a lot in the top 10 that are not going to be in the top 10. There's a lot in the top 20 that are not going to be in the top 20 in a year from now. Mark my words, guys. This is my opinion. Maybe I'm going to be wrong. That could happen, but highly unlikely. <laughs> I'm going to be right on this, I think. Anyway, internet computer, the, I mean, the, the easiest way to say is I'm just so excited about it. Because if we look like at all the things that they're deploying, what internet computer is doing is exactly what we strategize for. The entire bear market, internet computer Definity developers have been building and building and building and building. They did not let FTX and Alameda manipulating their launch and failing at their launch affect the trajectory of what they built the internet computer for. And we're seeing that now because ICP is the only blockchain and it's not even just an AI blockchain. The AI blockchains fetch Singularity Net, Ocean Protocol. They can't even compute AI data. Internet computer can. And Dominic has showed us what they can do already, what they've launched on the blockchain already. What else are they building? So internet computer is doing what the AI blockchains can do. Internet computer is doing what the blockchains that have been around for years and promising interoperability, what they can do. Internet computer is doing what Ethereum and Polygon and Polkadot can do from a smart contract perspective, because the, the size of their smart contracts, what ICP calls canisters, is much, much larger within the internet computer ecosystem. So when I look at ICP DEX and I'm like, TVL is 17,000, this is terrible. And a lot of people would just throw this and say, eh, there's nothing here. Look at the DeFi ecosystem and internet computer, $100 million, there's nothing here. And I've seen the comments, I've seen people write on X, not understanding why anybody wants to look at internet computer or why anybody would invest. But the way I look at it is they are deploying now. They're not talking about what they're gonna build 
and deploy later, we're in the bull market and they're deploying. And there are other blockchains that are deploying too. Near Protocol is another one and big competitor to uh, internet computer. We see Solana deploying a lot, right? I wrote off Solana during the bear market, but guess what? The venture capitalists didn't and they were still in pumping probably tens of millions of dollars into developing things for Solana and it is paying off because now they're deploying. And there's other blockchains here, XRP, Cardano, Shiba Inu, haven't done anything over the last few years in terms of developing to deploy. And they're talking about, oh, well, we're gonna work on getting USDC now. It's like, what? We're in the bull market. Like, when are you gonna implement USDC? At the end of the bull market? Like that is, there are gonna be a lot of people who are gonna have very, very heavy bags at the end of the cycle, very heavy bags because they're still stuck in 2020. We're in 2024, we're in a new cycle. And in my view, internet computer is going to outperform most cryptos that you see other channels promoting. Most cryptos that most of the venture capitalists are, are holding. Because Solana can get bigger, but how much bigger can it get? They already have, I mean, look at Solana's, um, TVL. For Solana, they have $4.2 billion in total value lock. Now this could grow, definitely. But for them to go from 4 billion to 8 billion, it's gonna take a lot more than for ICP to go from basically nothing to a billion. And so this is why I'm excited about internet computer. I mean, this literally explains it right? It's already interoperable. You can swap coins within the ecosystem on ICPX. There was another, uh, I think ICP swap. You can, um, you can transfer between different blockchains, not just within the ICP ecosystem. I, I would imagine as ICPX grows and gets more liquidity on the blockchain, they'll probably expand their, their pairs of, um, of coins that are available for swapping. But generally speaking, guys, I mean, I have not seen anything to indicate that internet computer is not gonna outperform most of these other blockchains. There's nothing that I've seen about it. And the DeFi acceleration, the acceleration of putting proposals forward to make more coins liquid, why do they wanna make more coins liquid? I would imagine most of the people who are staking for eight years or five years or whatever, most of these are probably people who've been in internet computer for a long time, probably a lot of developers, probably a lot of um, the engineers. And so they can't even use their own coins in DeFi. These coins are locked. And what Dominic just proposed in the Dfinity forum, we have other videos coming out on that. They may have already come out is I would say, look at the video called ICP changes staking or ICP is ending staking. They're not really ending it. They're just changing the way that they do it, where they're going to create liquidity from staking. So all those coins, which is hundreds of millions of coins that are locked in the staking ecosystem currently, they're gonna unlock a lot of value by creating more liquidity. And as that liquidity becomes more available from these engineers, from these insiders, from these, you know, OGs, what do you think they're going to do with it? They're going to take these coins and move it into DeFi. I mean, yeah. So I know that in previous videos, I said that I've sold ICP. Yes, I took profits off the table, but I'm back in. And I think just based on what I'm seeing and hearing around the cryptoverse, people believe in ICP and in all of this AI that we've already seen being implemented and already deployed on the blockchain, the growth that we are about to see, it's going to be, it's literally going to melt faces. And then the price action, I would imagine, is going to also melt faces. 
a lot of people in crypto, a lot of venture capitalists say, oh, Near Protocol is great because, you know, the, the Near Protocol founder met with the NVIDIA founder. Who gives a shit? Can Near actually compute data on their blockchain already? Do they have AI capabilities already? From my, what I've seen, not yet. It's in development. Internet computer, it's in production. Big difference. Now, I'm not fighting Near. I actually think Near is going to do extremely well. And I think that Near doing well is going to help Internet Computer do well. And I think Internet Computer doing well is going to help Near do well. I really believe this. And I think that holders should look at it this way as well. Because the same way that Bitcoin dictates where the rest of the market's going to go, these AI heavy um, and compute heavy blockchains like near an internet computer, they're going to help each other. So while we have all of these other ecosystems, oh, we're going to create artificial super intelligence coin and we're going to merge three cryptos together. And there's no product. There is no product yet. Maybe there will be, but right now we don't have a product An internet computer. We do have a product. So yeah, <clears throat> I think you guys kind of get the point. I am very bullish on internet computer. Bullish on Nier as well, but I'm more bullish on internet computer because it's a blockchain for blockchains. It literally is. And it's not a one trick pony. And they're not just talking. And their developers didn't let the price manipulation affect their development and creating new products. So we'll see where this goes. I'm sure many of you who are watching are excited about Internet Computer as well. Let me know what you guys think down below about Internet Computer, Solana going, oh, by the way, Solana going all in on payments, right? They're not even, Solana's not even really touching AI. They're not even touching compute. They're looking at payments, which is like all the other blockchains do this already. The Solana Foundation uh, head of payments said it's important to know that crypto is not just Bitcoin and Doge and NFTs. Blockchains are really alternative rails for payments and financial solutions. If you think about mainstream, we are very early, even in the awareness side of things. And so they're going all in on payments. But so is every other blockchain. Litecoin for payments. Bitcoin Lightning Network for payments. Ethereum for payments. Polygon for payments. I mean, I can keep going on and on. There's nothing special about that. And while Solana does have a lot of other things that they have going on in their ecosystem besides just payments, the focus on payments, it hasn't really panned out for any of these ecosystems yet. And when it does, what is going to be the determining factor between Solana versus Algorand for payments? It's really going to be the bandwidth, the ability for the, the blockchain to process the transactions and the cost. And Solana on both of those has had issues previously. It cannot process at a very fast speed and it goes down. Now, are they working on that? Yeah, but payments, I mean, think about Visa network and MasterCard and all that, tens of thousands of transactions per second globally. And the, the network cannot go down. So internet computer, in my view, and based on the metrics, can compute faster and better than many of these other blockchains out here. Because if, if they can process AI data, they're going to process all this other micro data way better than a blockchain that can't even process payment data, right? And granted, I'm not saying Solana going down is a negative thing necessarily because it does show that there's demand for it. That's clear. But if they're having this many issues just with transaction processing, how can Solana ever process AI compute, which is way more um, bandwidth intensive, right? It just doesn't make sense. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button. That way you never miss a new video. And I'll see you on the next video, Crypto On.